Good evening. Let's discuss the etiology and the pathology of anterior uveitis. How do I classify the uvea into different structures? So the uvea is one large structure and it is divided into an anterior, intermediate and a posterior part. When I say the patient has anterior uveitis, I am primarily referring to the iris and the ciliary body. And even in the ciliary body, I am talking about the pars plicata. So if the patient has anterior uveitis, I would uh, have an iritis or an iridocyclitis or only a cyclitis. So cyclitis refers to the ciliary body. Most common is iridocyclitis because the iris and the ciliary body are one continuous structure because of which if one gets affected, the other will naturally also get affected. Intermediate uveitis involves a part of the ciliary body called the pars plana, which is more posterior. So pars planitis, periphery of the retina and the periphery of the choroid. Whereas posterior uveitis mainly deals with the choroid and the retina. And the retina is the, you know, the part of retina that is closer to the posterior pole. Pan uveitis refers to involvement of all layers. Another way to classify is on a clinical method. Acute uveitis is the most common and even amongst that acute anterior uveitis is the most common type of uveitis. A chronic uveitis will be more likely to be bilateral and associated with a systemic disease. So which disease will I call acute and which disease will I call chronic? Again, that is a clinical diagnosis. There is no set point as to, you know, until this duration you will have an acute and beyond this to be chronic. But usually we consider it to be four weeks across medicine. If the patient has no clinical features for more than three months, either with or without treatment, then the patient is said to have gone into remission. And if such a patient with remission presents back with a disease, which means he has no features for more than three months and then comes back with certain clinical features, such a disease is called a recurrence. And if this happens within three months, then this is called a relapse. So one of the most difficult things in uveitis is not the treatment, it is actually deciding what is causing the, the uveitis, the etiology of uveitis. There are six different you know, theories of uveitis etiology. There's infective, immunological, toxic, traumatic, associations with systemic diseases and finally if you do not know what is causing then idiopathic so across all these wide uh, you know etiologies with their respective investigations it very often becomes difficult to decide what exactly is causing the uveitis so the job of the ophthalmologist is to narrow down based on history and clinical examination the investigations that the patient would require because advising all investigations in all patients does not make sense so this is where the clinical judgment comes in firstly infective an exogenous infection, say for example, either it is a penetrating injury or a perforated ulcer or in a post-operative case. So any of these three can introduce an infection from the exogenous uh, you know, sources. Endogenous, there is already a source somewhere inside, either the patient has fever or in the current situation, say a COVID infection. So somewhere, somehow that infection reaches the uvea and starts infecting it. And more commonly, it is a secondary spread of infection from the conjunctiva in the form of conjunctivitis, from the sclera in the form of scleritis, keratitis comes from the cornea, and very often seen orbital cellulitis and orbital thrombophlebitis. So these are the sources of infective organisms that can reach the uvea and cause an infective uveitis. So which organisms am I talking about? It is most commonly a bacterial, and even in bacterial, there are two types, there's a granulomatous and a non-granulomatous. Classic granulomatous organisms are tuberculosis, syphilis, leprosy, and brucellosis. Whereas the non-granulomatous, also called pyogenic, these are less common but also seen where, you know, in, in a clinical setting. Streptococcus, staphylococcus, pneumococcus, or a gonococcus. Viral is less common, herpes zoster, herpes simplex virus, and cytomegalovirus. Parasitic is even rarer, toxoplasma, toxocara oncocerca and amoebiasis and the least common is fungal and rickettsial uveitis. The second theory of uveitis is immunological in which very first and the most important there is an allergic reaction to some organism. So there is a sensitization of the uveal tissue with uh, antibody production in the body and a second attack with the same organism will produce a uveitis. For example, suppose the patient had tuberculosis. So say one organism of tuberculosis found its way to the uvea and because of which the patient developed uh, an immune response. So once the patient develops an immune response, at that moment he is not going to show uveitis. It is the second attack, which means the second organism coming to the uveal tissue that is going to incite an allergic reaction. So this is very commonly seen in case of tuberculosis in which the organism source is from the lymph node or from the lungs. Uh, 
and from streptococcus organism which comes from the teeth paranasal sinuses tonsils or the genitourinary tract the less common immunological variants are anaphylactic which is just like any other type 1 hypersensitivity reaction autoimmune and lastly atopic so this is very this is the the phenomenon of atopic is the same as that happens in bronchial asthma so an airborne inhalant is a trigger for immunological reaction very often you get hla associated uveitis so what do i mean by hla associated the patient has uveitis and tests positive for one or more of the hla so hla is human leukocyte antigen residing on chromosome 6 of the human dna so if certain hla types are positive in a patient this patient is more likely to have uveitis and the associated conditions with it for example if hla b27 is positive which is the most common hla to come positive in a patient of uveitis the patient could have coexisting ankylosing spondylitis reiter's disease or inflammatory bowel disease associated uveitis and psoriatic arthritis so not only does it predispose you to uveitis it also predisposes you to the the other conditions that it may be associated with if it is b5 or b51 bichet's disease is very commonly seen and bichet's disease associated uveitis dr4 dw15 very commonly seen with voked koyonagi harada's disease now toxic uveitis so there is some toxin production it is not an organism it is a certain toxin that is produced which causes uveitis endogenous sources so organisms such as pneumococcus or gonococcus are very you know commonly toxin producing organisms so these toxins induce a uveitis reaction leukemia or lymphoma again either due to the tumor cells themselves or due to certain metabolic changes that these tumors produce exogenous source could be anything it could be something like talcum powder it could be something like a foreign body anything that can irritate the uvea is going to produce uveitis and finally endocular sources so either a retinal detachment because there is going to be a pigment dispersion of the, in the retina either a hemorrhage which is, which could be a vitreous hemorrhage or a hyphema in the aqueous or tumor any intraocular tumor most commonly malignant melanoma is going to produce a toxic uveitis traumatic which is uh, the this uh, fourth type is traumatic in which we am talking about sympathetic ophthalmitis trauma to one eye produces a uveitis in the other eye uh, certain systemic disorders are associated with uveitis such as sarcoidosis polyarthritis nodosa rheumatoid arthritis diabetes mellitus again shows an increased incidence of uveitis gout dissimilated lupus erythematosus and certain dermatological conditions such as lichen planus psoriasis or pemphigus so all these systemic disorders show an association and an increase in incidence of uveitis so if you see a patient of sarcoidosis also look for features of uveitis that the patient may not present to you with but may be present and conversely if you're looking at a patient of uveitis who fits in the age group who fits in the category that he could have sarcoidosis then perform investigations accordingly and lastly if you do not know the cause of uveitis which sadly in many cases even with the best of investigations is not possible to find out then you label it as an idiopathic uveitis it does not change the treatment but then you are always unsure of what caused the uveitis and hence you know the prospects of recurrence of the disease cannot be properly explained to the patient so let's look at the pathology of uveitis what exactly goes wrong when i'm talking about pathology i am the first thing the first question that i ask is that is this uveitis a type of suppurative or a non suppurative uveitis suppurative means it is a pus producing organism very commonly pneumococcus or gonococcus and i am classically talking about endophthalmitis or panophthalmitis in this scenario other organisms that commonly cause suppurative uveitis are staphylococcus or streptococcus and suppurative uveitis will be considered as a separate topic we'll discuss that you know separately what i'm more interested in in this lecture is the non suppurative uveitis So when I say non-superative, it is a non-pus producing organism, and again this could be granulomatous or non-granulomatous. Let's deal with the non-granulomatous first. The first and foremost problem that happens in non-granulomatous uveitis is there is an increased permeability of blood vessels. So when the permeability increases, there is a breakdown of the blood aqueous barrier. With the breakdown of blood aqueous barriers, all the exudates that are supposed to stay in the bloodstream, I mean exudates, I mean the polymorphic nuclear cells, they don't exist as exudates in the blood. they are polymorphic nuclear cells but if the permeability increases these cells are going to enter the anterior chamber and these can form exudates in the form of hypopion that is pus in the anterior chamber and infiltrates in the form of corneal infiltrates or keratic precipitates 
So this can happen in the anterior chamber and posterior chamber as well because they are continuous structures. Vitreous can be involved in a severe infection and obviously the uvea has to be involved because this is a case of uveitis. When the inflammation becomes strong enough, adhesions can form between the iris and the lens, the posterior surface of the iris and the lens. So such an adhesion is called a posterior synechia. In the image shown on the right upper side, the synechia is act have actually been broken either pharmacologically or naturally. And the red or brownish ring that you see on the lens is actually the remnant of the posterior synechia. So that is a sign that synechia have occurred in the past and you have been successfully able to break it. And if the lens is getting compromised in the form of, you know, posterior synechia, a complicated cataract is going to ensue. Aqueous flare and keratic precipitates are basically features that occur after the permeability increases sufficiently. So when the permeability of the blood vessels increase, the proteins also leak out. And these proteins are seen in the anterior chamber as a flare, as fine particulate matter in the anterior chamber. So normally the anterior chamber is supposed to be clear. This flare gives it a turbid appearance and a powdery appearance inside. Keratic precipitates are nothing but these exudates that we have spoken about. They get deposited on the endothelial side of the cornea. Now, since the iris is undergoing edema, there is going to be a water logging appearance of the iris. It's going to be as though the iris has been inflamed and a lot of fluid has accumulated inside it. So there is an iris edema and a very muddy appearance. Normally the iris has crypts which means there are these are just depressions in the iris. These depressions are going to get eradicated. These, there is going to be a blurring of the crypts because of this edema. The mobility of the iris naturally ham is hampered because it, one of the characteristic findings of inflammation is functio laser, which is loss of function. So there's a decreased mobility and contraction of the sphincter pupillae. Uh, uh, the decreased mobility, I'm sorry, and the sphincter pupillae contracts, which is the constrictor pupillae, and the pupil is in a state of constriction, which is sluggishly reacting to light. That is why a patient of uveitis will always have a meiotic pupil. And finally, if the inflammation is sufficiently bad enough and sufficiently long enough, there is going to be iris atrophy as shown in these, this image as a white patch at the 10, 10 to 11 o'clock position and there is going to be an iris necrosis and atrophy. Let's talk about granulomatous uveitis pathology. It is basically a chronic inflammation. The patient is not going to give you a history of acute infection. It is going to be months or perhaps even years long. There is a presence of some kind of an irritant. Something is irritating the uvea for a very long duration. So this irritant could either be a hemorrhage, either in the anterior chamber or in the posterior chamber, uh, or even in the posterior segment. In the vitreous, as a case of vitreous hemorrhage, it can also present as a uveitis. Some necrosis has occurred. That could be an irritant because the necrotic tissue itself uh, acts as an irritant for granulomatous uveitis. Certain non-pyogenic organisms, such as we have already spoken about TB, leprosy, syphilis, Leptospirosis is an addition to the list and certain viral, fungal or helminthic infections. Very rare but uh, very often present as granulomatous rather than a non-granulomatous uveitis. Certain conditions have their etiology unclear such as sarcoidosis, sympathetic ophthalmitis and VKH that is Vop Koyanagi Harada's disease. So we are still not sure what causes a granulomatous reaction in these diseases. But in any case, in a case of granulomatous uveitis, there is going to be an aggregate of lymphocytes, plasma cells and mononuclear cells. So these come together and these form aggregates. So wherever these aggregates accumulate, there are going to be nodules that are going to form. So these nodules very commonly form at the iris, at the pupillary margin. And this is because these aqueous convection currents that carry the aqueous from the posterior chamber to the anterior chamber. There is going to be a zone of transition at the pupil. So that is why pupil is the region where many, where most of the deposition of these aggregates occur. So if it happens at the aggregates, uh, if it ha happens at the pupillary margin, then it is going to be called a coeps nodules. If it happens around the mid iris, then it is going to be called a busacus nodule. And if these aggregates deposit on the endothelial side, this is again going to be called keratic precipitates, but it has a very specific name called mutton fat keratic precipitates. So granulomatous uveitis, mutton fat keratic precipitates. So that takes care of the etiology and pathology of the uvi acute anterior uveitis. We'll deal with the clinical features and management in the next lecture. Thank you. If any suggestions, please message and let me know which other topics you would like me to cover. Thank you. Good day and stay safe.